All right, everybody, shalom and welcome to the Yishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting on the Land of Israel Network, on my Facebook page, and on the YouTube channel called I on Zion. So shalom and shalom to all of you folks. Uh, looking forward to uh, chatting with you uh, as you join the stream right now on Facebook and on YouTube uh, and maybe on other mediums. And we look forward to your comments. Please leave uh, the comments in the chat so we could uh, post them on the screen uh, and discuss the issues that are interesting to you. And we have with us today, uh, Rabbi Mike Foyer is going to be joining us in a second. Our conversation today is going to be about COVID, about riots, about sovereignty, and what I call cloudy with a chance of quail, uh, which is the Torah portion of Baalotcha. Rabbi Mike Foyer joins me. Rabbi Mike, shalom and welcome. I love it. Cloudy with a chance of quail. I love it. It's cloudy with a chance can of I be quail. Pedantic? Can I be pedantic yes. for a moment? Yes. Yes. Other media. Other media. media. Right? Other media. As, as a media personality, much. don't say mediums. That's right. Okay. Very good. So nice. other, that's right. We, and right. So the Torah, we cannot have that from Torah. And I just want to show you that I have a feature that I really like a lot, uh, which is I can show uh, other people's comments. And here's Shlomo Algera, my good friend saying Shalom from Givat Uba, which is here in Gush Etzion. So Shalom, a good friend Shlomo and Shalom to everybody. Uh, please join us. Rabbi Mike Foyer, uh, you're a, an educator at the Pardis Institute. Uh, and you're also the creator of the Jewish Story podcast on the Land of Israel Network, and that's found, uh, all that stuff is found on your other website, which is jewishstory.co. I just right. posted it. And thank you so much for joining me uh, today for a conversation about very timely issues uh, that, that yeah. are, the, the, the world, I, I'm always cautious to not over accept the sensationalization that the mediums, medias, <laughs> might might uh, uh, impose on on um, on a scene that they want to portray a certain way, because I, mean, I know living that, in Israel, like yeah, as exactly. settlers, we don't want to buy into that that's, too quick. That's right. That's exactly right. And oftentimes, when I'm in the United States, I look on what's happening here in Israel through their lens, and I'm like, that is not the reality. The reality is much more that we're buying diapers and milk in the store and not that we're being terrorized or nuclear Iran is, is coming down the pipes. So I, I know to try to filter out uh, like a media uh, exaggeration, of a type of bias that, that seems to me a bit exaggerated. At the same time, uh, we are also not on the ground here in the land of Israel. We're not on the ground in America. And as I'm looking towards America right now, it's certainly, you know, as, as, as the media calls it, America you know, is on fire. There, there are riots in the streets, 200 cities, uh, and we're seeing so many of the, these videos of looting, uh, of glass breaking, and this on top of the COVID-19 crisis, and you're really seeing uh, uh, that great country in, in a heap of some kind of, emo Pain. we've talked for a while that they're Pain. under some kind of emotional turmoil, but now it's, it's gone physical. Yeah. I mean, I tell you, my brother lives in Brooklyn. He had such an Israeli comment the other day. I asked him, called him up, how are you doing? What's going on? He said, is, you know, is your neighborhood on fire? He's like, no, no, no the rioting's, rioting's a couple blocks away. I was right, like, oh my right. gosh. That's, you know, it sounds so familiar. It's like, no, no, right. as long as you don't go over there, it's fine. <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, the, the pain, I think that the pain is very important to sort of keep focused on here because, of course, there's rioting, but there's also protest. Right. And and um, I was trying to explain to my children the other day the difference between a, a cause and a trigger. I mean, the, the murder of George Floyd was a trigger for what's happening right now. So, but but the cause is much deeper and and frankly bigger and more difficult to engage, which is why sometimes it, there's there's a there's a a desire to just sort of give in to unchecked rage. I'm not talking about the looters. I want to be clear. Anybody who's out there stealing things right now is just a thief period in my opinion destroying property yeah, but, but 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 wait a minute wait a minute now now looting they're they're clearly thieves but the question is were they thieves yesterday uh or does a situation uh allow for for some kind of atmosphere oh, yeah, where yeah, people, yeah yeah where norms sure. are broken no that's proven that's proven that 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 that, that people who are otherwise law-abiding or at least too scared to act on those impulses yeah when the, when when the when the bounds are loosed, all kinds right. of things come out. No, no, right. it's, no it, question. It's important to say that law abiding is oftentimes 
fear of the law, right? The and, Mishnah and says to pray for the welfare of the government. Without it, people would swallow each other alive. And you're seeing right. it right now. But my point is, is that I think it's it's really important for us as 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 Jews, as Israelis, as human beings, to not miss the underlying pain, which which is a result of the real causes and not just the trigger. I explain to my kids: if I build a huge fire on the side of this, uh, build it, don't light it, soak the wood and gasoline and oil, and then just walk away. Some guy who smoking a cigarette flicks his butt, jerk, right, lands in it. Well, he started the fire. But mm -hmm. he's not really the cause. Right. Uh, in this case, though, there are, it seems, uh, also depends on which uh, uh, media you read. Uh, it, you know, yeah. there may be other elements there. I'll give, I'll give a great example. Um, my mom, by the way, my mother is, is with us uh, uh, right now. She says, uh, Shalom from Jerusalem. So, you know, I was raised in, in, a, in a house where I understood myself to be a type of feminist. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understood that I was interested in seeing my, my mother and my sister flourish intellectually and otherwise, and basically saw them as, I, I, never, I never thought the, the, the other thought, you know what I mean? And only later did I have to associate that with a, with a movement. But it was right. obvious to me that, that this was a kind of, um, it wasn't even empowerment. It was the norm that men and women are. It was an are, egalitarian are, assumption. Right. It was an egalitarian assumption. Let's call it that way. Uh, again, even that word doesn't come into play when you don't know the other side. But, right. but when it, in, in time, it turns out that feminism that I understood, which is empowerment of women and, and, and egalitarianism, uh, turned into something very different when what I understood or understand as Marxist feminists, a type of group that wants to split between – cause – uh, tensions within society, and instead of class warfare, wants to make it gender warfare, and later on ethnicity warfare. It's uh, identity war now. I mean, take identity war in the, general. What the standard okay. of measure is right. So, but but they'll take a theme that's really there, piggyback on it, and take it to a completely different conclusion. Instead of women's rights, it's actually a splitting between women and men, splitting up the family, and a kind of tension that's created artificially on purpose uh, in order to undermine societal stability. So too, you see right now, there is, there, there maybe is an underlying cause, but the people who want to exploit this moment are varied. Some want rights. Others want anarchy. Others want to dethrone Trump. Uh, and others want to see a, 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 a socialist, a Marxist socialist uh, a turnover, kind of uh, turning, uh, you know, the United States into an Argentina or something. So, uh, you you are seeing a lot of people throw in their hat into this fight. Yeah, you know, let's go with your your the, the feminist model because I think it's it's clear in the way you played it out is that one has to differentiate between um, personal violence and structural violence in this case. Like, and that's one of the big switches in like the fourth wave feminism, this later phase that you're associating. I think more or less correctly with Marxism, although it's there's more to the story there. Um, is that that um, the feminism you experienced growing up was about individuals being feeling empowered to to actualize themselves right the later stages of feminism without saying rightly or wrongly began to focus on the structures which intrinsically kept women out however you define them and that's why as you said oh it looked to break up the family structure cuz because frankly, you could hear an argument that that the, the the need within the family structure for women to bear children limits their potential, keeps them in a position of oppression, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay, I could, I could hear that. Right? But what you're identifying is a social structure, which I didn't do this to you. I personally am not exercising that violence. It's built in. And so what's happening right now is that the intellectual world, with, which is in, it's important. I'm not saying I agree with that evaluation or every conclusion drawn from it. But it's important to notice that, that and this is what the, the, the deep potential positive, which can come out of what's happening in America right now, is um, um, America, and we could make some jumps to here as well, needs to look structurally. The goal here is not to have nicer police. Although that's an important outcome. It's certainly, you know, that's, but that's not the goal. The goal is to ask the deeper question how is it that that the number of, of black men in America incarcerated is so disproportionate 
to their representation in the population. How is it that you can look at the population distribution within American cities and see very clear racial divisions between city, suburb? I mean, like, strikingly clear. And by the way, some of these answers are actually quite easy to answer. I'm not going to go into it now because it's not the time or place. But, but you understand what I'm saying is that the problems America faces today are structural problems. They're problems rooted in the history of well, slavery. Well, and, it's, and, it's, and, also, it's also that the country itself is a type of experiment, a social experiment on its own. I don't think it's so clear the answer is because, because you've never really had a country that tries to smush everybody together and give them equality as opposed to Israel, which is an ethnic national state or a Hungary or a Poland. You have a very unique idea there, which is like there is no identity or nationality. It's based upon an idea and a dream. And then when you have... Uh, when you no, have a, that, a, a, a breakdown of that idea dream, maybe, maybe, I mean, I, I thought it sounds it nice. Listen, that sounds nice, man. But the reality is, is America has always been based on an ideal dream, which is a white Anglo-Saxon always, always Protestant is. male from the right, beginning, okay. from okay, the so, beginning. That's what's always you're saying. It's a white Christian country. So then you could understand right. that, that, that black people in, in um, African-Americans are, are not as comfortable there or doesn't, or don't as, as comfortable. How do they get there? there? Huh? How did they get there? How did all those African Americans end up in America? Slavery, right? And, okay. and 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 but 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 my point is that structurally America is built around that. And unless there's a positive engagement of that reality, the union will fly apart at the seams. Okay, but I'm saying that might indeed happen. That 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 might. I'm, I don't I don't foresee no, that. I, all all empires end. I'd rather not see it go down that way but yeah well, i'm not even talking about the empirical aspect i'm talking more about the as you said the structural country aspect of it it's a it's a well, that's an empire it's united states of america right 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 okay i'm saying empire government borders past of its well, borders you spend most of your time in america in the northeast buddy you spend a little a, time west of the mississippi and you'll understand the federal government in a very different way right absolutely i i i, I hear that that is true um or south of mason dixon for that matter <laughs> anyway, I, th I think I'm not, you know, a lot of a lot of my kind of conservative colleagues are big Reagan fans. I myself am not such a big Reagan fan, but but uh, but there is one phrase that he said, which I think is eminently true, which is which is that uh, it takes one generation for the ideals of America to be undermined here in Israel. It's not the same. You can have generations and generations of people who, 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 who didn't have a sense of Zionism, but when it gets triggered, since it's so deep in our collective unconscious, since it's so it's deep. It's got its roots in a culture of 3,000 right, years. Right, I mean. there's so many layers. Like you can you can do it as as Hebrew nationalism, or you could do it as as, as God's word, or you could do right, it as- Messianism, you can you know, there's, there's cultural. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, like I, 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 I sometimes want, wonder at myself. I look at myself and I'm like, this is unbelievable. Like I, I like read, Jewish history, then I read Torah, I read this kind of Torah and that kind of Torah, halachic Torah, and midrashic Torah. It, and then you and read then, the news. Right, and then I read the news, and it's all one. It's all one issue. Uh, and, 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 right, and it's, it's it's you know, like like when you're in America, it's not as binding. It's not as binding. I, I want to tell you a quick story that I saw uh, two family members of mine. I was in, in America uh, maybe last summer, and I saw two family members of mine from different parts of the country uh, one watches CNBC, the, the other one watches Fox, and these are right. old friends, and they were unable to speak to one another, and the F-bomb started flying within two minutes of them sitting down with one another and haven't seen each other physically in six months. They just went right at it. I thought to myself, if two Jewish men who have been successful, who are both pro-United States, both capitalists, by the way, both pro-Israel, who have a similar life trajectory cannot sit and talk. So, yeah. so, so that means that there's something very problematic in the in the conversation uh, that the United States is having. Now, listen, I want to tell you something. Whenever we get too far into what's happening in the United States, I I, ha I feel this kind of like like if you notice my my commentary on Twitter, I don't really touch the United States issues so much. Not yeah, because I don't have an opinion, but because I don't feel like I, my opinion is important. There are more informed opinions. And and my personal mission is is to help build up our country, Israel. That's my that's my life goal. And and what's happening in America is not my life goal. Can I say something about that? Go ahead. Just one thing, and we don't have to get all the way into it if you don't want to. I think therefore what's happening in America right now needs to be a wake up call for us as we look towards sovereignty. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because we, if we don't consider very seriously the power of structural violence, or the potential, by the way, of structural justice, you know, isn't that to all be negative, right? We risk creating a situation now because we have the strength to do it that our children's children will pay the bill for it. What you're seeing in America right now is a historical bill come due. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to think about that. Not, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not only in favor of sovereignty, I'm in favor of doing it now. Let's just do it. But that it needs to be done both in a way and with a mindset that there's a huge responsibility to every human being that lives between the Jordan and the sea, who lives within our land, and that we need to take that seriously, not just toward them, but within ourselves. All right, so so let's go. Let's give some examples of sovereignty. So some of my colleagues and I'm having a very vociferous debate oh, with uh, you know the Judean Samaria people, the West Bank people, the and the pro Jews living in these parts. So so they say you know uh, one of the contours of the plan is that a potential Palestinian state would be demilitarized, and right. I say to them that is a total joke. The Arab cities in Israel, Arab Israeli cities are already highly militarized with, with tons and tons and tons of weapons being snuck in. So if right, they're in, not tanks, but they've got automatic right, weapons. <laughs> right. So so, so while, while, while we can talk a lot about, you know, cre creating, God forbid, in my opinion, a Palestine on our ancestral homeland, and we, we pay lip service to demilitarization, first thing, I have two problems with that. One is, can we just ask the simple question, do or do not the Palestinians deserve a state in this land? Just answer that simple question, yes or no. For me, the answer is no. I don't believe that anybody else, anybody has a right for self-determination in our land. And they could be very naughty or very nice. Lo mañanoti does not interest me one way or the other because I'm not. it's not about a valuation of their niceness or not niceness. And so, to so that me, would have to do with the residency. What's that? I would say the question of naughty or nice is a question of residency, mm -hmm. not one of sovereignty, like self-determination. You understand what I'm saying? Meaning naughty people don't belong here. If they're naughty Jews, we'll deal with them internally oh, okay, as Jews. Okay. So you're taking <laughs> to the next step. You're taking to the next step, which is, which is, I think what you're asking is, if no, if the above answer is no, then what is the role of, of non-Jews in the land of Israel. What status and what role do they have? I really yeah. feel that like people have not defined that. I think you're absolutely right. I feel that like people yeah. do not have a, 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 def, a def definition in their head that works, that they can understand what Arabs, who let's say are pro-Israel, non-Jihadists, what is their status in Israel? Or even, by the way, they don't have to be pro-Israel. They just need to be pro-life. Pro or pro law, pro law. Yeah, pro law. That's what I mean by pro law. Right. I mean, you know, like right. the American sense. But like, right. you know, and and I'll go further. It's not just that people don't have a clear idea. It's that we have run from that question since the earliest moments of the Zionist movement. Now, in the beginning, it was I think important to run from that question because the reality was so overwhelming. Like the idea that a few Jews were going to come in the midst of it wasn't such a huge population, but certainly it was more than the Jews, right? And just like, okay, we'll we'll work it out. That's basically what they said. They right. punted. They punted. And you know what? God bless them that they punted. Otherwise, they would have folded. But that's what I mean. That created a historical debt. Right. And we're holding that debt right now. Right. And, right. and if we punt, you see what's happening in America right now? It doesn't hold a candle because America is not surrounded by supportive nation, nations that are supporting the active agents for its destruction from within. Right. <laughs> like, we can't punt right now. This needs We need to own this one and win the game. Right, and I would I would rephrase what you're saying to from my from my understanding that Israel is in a is in a point where like um, you have to shed a certain skin that was created in the 40s and certain structures that were created to match the population and the size and the power and the relative uh, 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 relative strength of Israel. Those were those were institutions created then. They have to shed now and become something much bigger. And I, I want to give one specific example. I'm very bothered by some of the sovereignty discourse that's happening now. And what's bothering me is that is that there is this I, I remember today that when Ben Gurion decided to uh, to announce that we are going for Israeli independence, that we are that that we are uh, declaring independence, 
right? Declaring a state an independent state. He did that against the will of most countries and even against the United States of America. And against Later, the will of many of his colleagues. And against many of his colleagues. But he said, this is the moment and we've got to be Chazak and people will follow us even later. Down the line, they'll accept us. So too, in, in I think 1982, Begin decided that he saw what was happening in Syria and he decided it's right now we have to assert full sovereignty over the Golan Heights. He did it in a surprise fashion. The Americans were far from knowledgeable about what he was, oh, yeah. his plan was. He sprung it on them and they were upset with him. So just as they were upset with him also for the Osirak bombing, uh, but he did it. And and then people later on accepted it and later on even thanked them for it. Okay. Right now we have a situation where we're talking about sovereignty of the heart of our heartland. And, and it's like, are you with me? Are you with me? We're looking behind our shoulders, looking to see if America is exactly going to match uh, uh, our, uh, you know, our, our assertions of, of sovereignty. And it bothers me atmospherically it bothers me atmospherically it is not sovereignty when you are dependent on somebody else to recognize it that is not sovereignty sovereignty is not the recognition of sovereignty sovereignty is when you are a, a, a sovereign and you say this is my land and i assert it on these uh, for this law and this law these rights and these rights you call it natural law call it history call it bible call it purchase call it war call it all these things and then it would be nice if people uh, acceded to that, to 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 what I've done, but it doesn't depend on that. Nobody can give you your freedom, right? Well, listen. I think that the deeper problem. I think that the uh, that looking outward is a posture, like you said, which is inherited from an essential aspect of Zionism. This sense that um, even Ben Gurion, with all of his courage and sort of uh, sort of like chutz, but as this kedusha, as we say, you know, like holy chutzpah, um, still felt very strongly that the project here could not survive without an international patron. Right. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I did this in my last episode on the, on, uh, on, uh, what's it called? The Six Day War. Six Day War. Six Day War. Right. I asked my clickbait title when I posted it was, what was the fundamental flaw in the Zionist project. I got called a Jew hater for the first time, by the way. Oh, speak with nice. Um, <laughs> like, I've been called a lot of things and perhaps deserved many of them. But, but, my, but my point was exactly what you're saying is that at a certain point, Zionism was an incredible project which achieved amazing things. But don't forget, yesterday's solution becomes tomorrow's problem like that. If you're wedded to the way you solved the problem as opposed to the fact that you solved it, and you're not willing to grow and evolve, like you so nicely said, shed that skin, especially in this situation, which I agree with you, we're, we're being called to step into a into a, a godlut, a bigness. Right. And by the way, that right. bigness is that bigness, I think, at this point, hinges on the role of the non-Jew within our society. It's not mm -hmm. a secondary question. Because the other pieces, I think partially this looking for the international backer is a bit of a red herring. Because the reality is, is that we don't have consensus as an arm. We don't even have like a clear vast majority as an um that this is the right thing. I think a lot of people feel it like oh duh, I mean th this is where we're from. But, th but but we're afraid because the way in which we have related to the Arabs of that live in this land up until now rightly troubles many people because we've related to them as a problem to be solved. And a sovereign who relates to other human beings as a problem to be solved, it doesn't usually end well. What we need to begin to do is relate to them as a responsibility to be taken. Now, what that looks like, as you know, I'm, I'm wide open on that. Like what it looks like in its legal models, what it looks like in its social models. I think that, that it's the 21st century people. Let's experiment. I, I, I want to give another story, story that has happened now in the news. It's broken and also something that I've seen myself. But before I do that, I just want to uh, uh, what's that to uh, uh, to point out some of the um, comments. comments. First thing we have, Marie says, Shalom from the UK. Hi, Marie. Hey. Uh, Yehuda Shamroth, very, uh, uh, very strong feelings. She says, it doesn't matter if they were thieves yesterday. They are, they are criminals now. All right. Um, Sha Kim says the world is burning disaster everywhere. Well, uh, I, I disagree. I mean, right. uh, it's actually things are good here, <laughs> e even for those Arabs who don't have it as well as you and I, right? They're, they're still pretty good, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, many of those Arabs have it better than you and I. Let's let's also be frank about that. There's a lot of there's a lot of wealth in our country, and oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, Barry says yes, an extra D in Samaria before November. God forbid, if the Democrats get in, they will pressure Israel. Well, that's a, that's a certainty. Although in many ways, it might be better off. I'll tell you, I, we I think we as a nation function better when we're in opposition to power than when we are like you're sensing when we when we have this posture of of uh subservience to it yeah it, it really it really bothers me it really bothers me i i, I want to tell you something rabbi mike i, I don't know if, if i can explain myself exactly well because it's because it's also like a kind of feeling and i am amazed at my fellow pundits and commentators and activists and political people i cannot believe how quickly we went back into shtetl i i just i'm just like and and I think people I think it's so natural for us that people don't even notice that they're in shtetl. They don't even know it. They themselves you want think to speak out. What you mean by going back into shtetl? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the this whole thing of waiting for American recognition for the sovereignty. There's something about it which the the way people are speaking about it is is this subservient kind of a modality, subservient mode and. Uh, 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 atmosphere, which we didn't have under Obama. Obama, God bless him, brought out a lot yeah. of this ire and this chutzpah, and this pissed offness, and they were like, hey man, we are freaking Israel, okay? We're free people in our right, land. You're not gonna, right, you're not going to tell us what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly, like, under our friends, uh, which which I do very much respect and appreciate and, and am, am quite thankful to them and to God for, for the great things that they've done. But the mode of like actually going underneath them, and I also blame some of the people in that administration, some of the Jews in that administration uh, who like that. They're kind of these well, the, like the court Jew is the embodiment of the shit. right. But you know they're a doubly kind of court Jew. They're not like a they're not they're they're an empowered court Jew. Um, or do in many, right? In many ways, they're like they're like they're like they're like they're lawyers on steroids. Okay, and yeah. there's something there's something. Listen, there's something. The, that is the history of the court Jew. The court Jew was you know how court Jew became a court Jew. He had one role vis-a-vis -vis the king. I provide. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I provide. Okay, and I'm good at it. Right, because I provide. In a way that nobody else can, like you said, lawyers on steroids. I solve problems. I right. get what you need. I right. find the guy. I get I it done. Him. I right. get it done. And because right. of that, <laughs> you'll that's do what I mean. Me. Right. And I and I just I got to tell you something. I don't think that you can have I, I it, it's something. There's there's a there's a remember when the when the lightsabers like zap one another when they get too close to one another like <laughs> zzz, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. Sure. It's like. You cannot have a super empowered court Jew, and I don't want I, the word court Jew sounds a little negative. Uh, oh, it, I don't know, maybe, it is. <laughs> yeah, but I don't mean it in a negative sense. I I I think that there's there are in in, in times of history people like Nehemiah. Nehemiah to me is a, one of the no, great gosh. heroes. Can I explain to you why why I think it's intrinsically negative and why I think it does? You, whether you you don't you don't mean it to be insulting, right? right. Um, but but I'll tell you why. The bottom line, the difference you're speaking about is who owns the context, right? right. Where right. is the Malchut? Don't right. forget, our vision of redemption is right. right? That, that we're going to stand on Mount Zion and we're going to judge Esau. You don't judge someone who owns the context. That means you or God is holding right. the context. And that's right. the challenge we're faced right now. Is America really the power of the world? In which case we're still in the shtetl on some level because when, when they whistle, we come or we get right. whacked. Are we right. willing to step into a world where, truth is, it's not true anymore. And, and we have an opportunity to help the world to come to a realization of a higher power through our sovereign actions. That's always our mission. Our sovereign actions are never just for ourselves. Please, Am Yisrael, anybody who's listening, don't forget that. Our sovereign actions are not for us. All right. You 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 got exactly what I'm what I'm what I was trying to get at. Um, and I would go deeper into it right now, but but we are low on time. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to parsha, man. Yeah, we got to hit the parsha. And interestingly enough, the parsha has a lot of themes that are similar because oh, yeah. there's themes of really this is the Torah portion. This one and others. Uh, maybe there's a, in my opinion there's a kind of triad uh, of Balotcha, Shlach, and Korach, which are 
which are the rebellion Torah portions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The political rebellion Torah portions, these are the three. Alternative um, leadership, alternative vision. Right, alternative leadership, and a, 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 a questioning of the leader as well, yep. uh, specifically a questioning of the leader. But before we get to that, let's just touch one more thing that's happening right now, which is uh, COVID is uh, is still around and oh, is yeah. making, its, making its rounds again. Israel posted its highest and, um, rate of, of um, tachlua. How do we call that? Getting sick. Uh, infection. infection. Highest rate of infection uh, in, in many weeks was yesterday, something like 119 new sick new sick people, excuse me. And uh, they're, they're considering – there's talk about the schools – being closed, so this thing is still. I mean, I want, talk all I want. Both my daughters' high schools are closed already. Uh -huh, I took my uh -huh. I took my eldest to get tested for COVID this morning. Uh -huh. they're, in, they're testing her entire school because the teacher was found with, with sick. Wow. So so um, yeah, it, and don't believe everything you read in the news. I saw they announced oh five high schools have been closed. It's interesting. I looked. Neither of their schools were on there. Mm -hmm. They're both closed. Speaking of COVID, we have a comment here from our good friend Erica from sunny Sweden. Uh, great to be part of the pod I'm live. Glad that Sweden is sunny. I would actually never have put those two words together. That's Maybe right. Sunny, about Sweden. Today's sunny Sweden, and that's that's really good. Uh, Louis says, uh, she says, uh, we must assert our rights boldly, matter of factly, and not ask the world for permission. Okay, you get what I'm saying. Good. Uh, Amir says, big hug. Rabbi Flesh is my buddy Amir, who I thought was gone from this world, and I'm so happy to see him. Oh, uh, we have, we have from Stockholm. Look at this. This is great. We got a whole, uh, we got a whole Sweden thing going on, and uh, and then we have. Um, but Barry says something different. He says the Arabs aren't Israel's responsibility. There are many Islamic countries. He's saying this is opposed to I think what you said. Yeah. Uh, which is he's saying no, it's not our problem. But I, I think Barry, what 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 I think you might agree with, it's not the, the Arabs. It's the residents yes. of the state of Israel, which is... My point is it's definitional to sovereignty that everyone who lives within your country is your responsibility. Right. The, the idea that everyone treat, gets treated the same is the like liberal Western notion, which may or may not be relevant here, but doesn't change the element of responsibility. I'm not a uh, fan of treating people as problems, certainly not as a category of people. Ian says, hi, from Australia, and I love these little flags that people are putting up. It's sort of a lot of fun. And Barry says... Your point about Obama, didn't he prevent Israel from bombing Iran's nuclear facilities? Maybe not so maybe not so good to have opposition. Yes, there was definitely complicated. for sure. Yeah, it was complicated. Sure. But but the Boy, well taken. Yeah, but the atmosphere was, mm -hmm. you know, like 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 we will we'll show you that. And, that's right. And 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 we gained a lot of uh, of a sense of of ourselves during the Obama period. And, that's and so I critical. but I think yeah. it's it's sadly, and I don't think that President Trump wanted this. But I can sense that there's a certain erosion of that sense of self uh, because of the uh, – and this is what I meant by shtetlness. I'm not even so sure sometimes that the, uh, uh, that the, that the power, the, um, the host or whatever it is means it. But we go into like back underneath yeah. the mask. So there's, there's a whole story to be told there, which you can piece out in the, in the Jewish story if you want, about the relationship or let's say the effect of absolute power – on Jewish posture. There's a close relationship between right. the rise of absolute power in Europe right. and the role of the Jews. And it's not a pretty one. Right. St Steve Brown says, can you talk about the protests and riots in America? Steve, we, we did that in the beginning of the program and we have to move on to a different kind of riot. We and have to move without on. Without any promise, my hope is to put out a, a podcast on that tomorrow. Right. Uh, so, just uh, one more thing. Sh Shlomo Algera, a good friend of mine says, Sovereignty in Area C is a good start. Eventually, we will be able to apply more sovereignty later. My concern is some of the right-wing parties will vote against the bill. Uh, they're not going to vote against the sovereignty bill, uh, the, the right-wing parties in opposition. They're not going to vote against the sovereignty bill. The question is, is there linkage between sovereignty slash annexation and the two-state plan, which is what the uh, uh, the the deal of the so-called deal of the century is, which is a two-state plan, which offers seventy percent of the land to the Palestinians. At the end of the day, if if there's no linkage between those two things, great. If there is a linkage, which I, I thought there was, but a friend of mine was trying to convince me that there isn't. 
then uh, we have to we have to be concerned about it. Okay, and, let's. Yeah, go I would add to that one. Sorry, go one ahead. more thing, which go is ahead. that with Tali Bennett last week said what we want is maximum land, minimum Arabs. First of all, I appreciate his honesty. Right. Um, and the second of all, notice that what you're doing is you're punting because you're just going to squeeze these people into an ever small. They're not. They're human beings. They're not going to just sit there. If you don't take right. responsibility for that, whatever that responsibility looks like, right. you're just punting a problem down the yeah. field that our children will get in the face. Look at what's happening yeah. in America. Yeah, and that is a very shtetly phrase. Yeah, it's like, uh, like it, about this, it, about that. Yeah. Right, it's like, it's like I will shrink my borders to have me inside the shtetl, me and my kind, and outside of the shtetl is outside the shtetl. But that's yeah, not, that, that's not... That's not a. That's, that's not, not the language of. Uh, that's right. You're that's not, not the language. You're not the malchut where everything right. within my borders is my responsibility. Right. And I will do with it as I think is right. Right. So I just, I just want to tell you something. You know, you remember you had that period during. Uh, you had some period. Was it during the beginning of COVID? But you were binge watching the Marvel movies that you like. Yeah. It was actually. Well, yeah, but it wasn't. It was before COVID. To be honest no, with was you. When I, you was injured, when I was injured. Yeah. I was injured. I was injured. My my knee. Yeah, so. I recall now. So I don't I don't usually fall into into binge watching anything. No, 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 no. No, I really don't. I just don't. But have you, uh, have but you stumbled, I, you I have other ways to waste my time. But uh, but have you stumbled? Do you want to I, talk about? I, it? I, I, I stumbled. I fell. My good friend Jake, my very very good friend Jake, uh, sure. wanted me to uh, watch this show called The Last Kingdom, which is about um, the. Um, the uh, the what are they called now? This is a fight for England in the kind of uh, early Middle Ages between Saxons? the Danes, between the Saxon the Dan Norm? yeah, oh, no, between the Danes and the Saxons, yeah, Saxons and Danes, okay. and and so it's he, really told, really he says to me, Isha, you got to watch this because you got to watch how the folks are are thinking about power and about sovereignty and about you know. And uh, and and how to kind of understand the other? It's really it's really a, mo a show about about others. The the central character in the middle is on the one hand uh, a Saxon, but he was adopted by the Danes, and he goes back and forth. I in no way to recommend anybody to watch the show, um, no. but but I, but it was it it really did put a more warlike thinking in my in my head and a more kind of understanding of um, a grip over people. So anyway, I got a little bit I got a little bit sidetracked in the last few days around this. Let's 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 shift gears, shall we? Let's move away from the, from the from the Saxons uh, and into let's write the Torah, which is uh, we have we have plenty of our own drama and problems. And oh yeah. In the Torah. Oh, okay, yeah. The, the Torah. We're talking about the Torah portion. Let me just uh, bring it up first thing. My good friend Dan Mastery says Jews sojourning in Boca Raton love Yishai and Rabbi Mike. So thank you very much. Thanks. Guys. Uh, uh, okay. Now like we have sojourning. A, sojourning. That's right. We have a Torah portion. I know it's here. It's called Parshat Baalotcha. Here it is. I put it up on the screen. Baalotcha. And it starts off, it starts off innocently enough, but not really, even from the get-go. It says, it says when you um when you put up the, the menorah candles. Sorry, I'm just turning it. The book is the book of uh, in the desert, or what we call it numbers. Uh, it's a long Torah portion, and it's chapter eight. And it starts off by saying when you when you put up uh the seven candles, uh, put them. Uh, th they will. They will light. They will be lit. Seven candles, right? And the the kohen got, the kohen is in charge of beautifying these candles, um, and that's your job is to is to make sure that they're lit every single day and that they're relit. And the, the Torah doesn't say a lot about it, but then it says, oh, and did I mention that the menorah has got to be made out of one piece of gold, one big piece of gold? It's got these flowers. It's got these uh, uh, like. You know, fruit parts. It's got these um, cups. It's got it's got different parts that make up the menorah. The menorah is hard to describe, famously. Even Moshe right. Rabbeinu had a hard time understanding okay. its Again? description. Again, God. right? But the Torah portion starts with the menorah. Yeah. Here's what it looks like, and here's the guy to take care of it and light it. It's not just a thing. It's got to be lit. It's got an action it's on it. Right. Right. Okay. And now, now it starts nice enough. It's about light, and it's about you know. Interestingly enough, right from the get-go, there's a jealousy here. Mm -hmm. uh, Rashi says that that Aaron saw Aharon, a Kohen, the, the Kohen Gadol, saw that the other uh, heads of tribes were were bringing all these gifts to the Mishkan, and, and he got jealous of them. He's like, well, what's my role in it? 
And God says, well, your role in it is this menorah that's an eternal thing. It's an eternal light. And the Ramban famously says, wait a minute, why, why didn't you talk about the korbanot and the other stuff? Right. And the Ramban's answer that. is, the Ramban's answer is, even when there's no korbanot, there's going to be your children, the Maccabees, the Hasmonean kingdom, who are going to rise up against their oppressors, and they're going to light that menorah. And that's your, that's your folks. That's the, that's the warriors that are priests, and that they will light that menorah in the temple even in dark times. Which, I mean, it's interesting, of course, we have all ourselves remember that through the lighting of the menorah in our homes, the Hanukkah. And, and that's that place where, um, even though I'm not a Kohen, you're not a Kohen, we're not the children of Aaron, we're the children of Israel. Nevertheless, we're stepping into our role as Mamlechet Kohanim, as, as, as a nation of, of, of ministers to the world, of priests, as the, as the emissaries from God to the world. And, it, and our job, of course, is to spread light, right? That's the way we're meant to do it. So, so this Torah portion starts with the spreading of light, but the rest of the Torah portion is going to have quite a bit of uh, efforts to put down that light. Which right, is the yeah, sign that it was working. Right. Never forget that. Is if people ignore you, you're you're not doing anything. All right. It's, so we you know. So we had the lamplighters, that's the Kohanim, and the and the and the fighters for that light. And then there's another group of lamplighters. That's we've talked about it many times. I don't want to go too deep in it, but that's the folks who asked for Pesach Sheni. They asked right. for a reprieve, a second chance in order to do what they missed. And and there's a few things there that happen. One is that that Moses says, stop, and God will tell you the answer. Not tell me, but it will come through me, but I won't even say that. I'm giving you God's answer. And that says something about Moses and his ability to hear God at any time. And it also shows, Rashi tells us, that some people have the merit of bringing down new Torah when they ask for it. And, and that a Torah that was not yet revealed came through their merit their willingness to, to ask God uh, about the new Torah. And, and so, so these are also lamplighters. Comments. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not so sure which one's the, the light because, you know, there's two pieces. There's the content and then there's the will. Meaning, they, 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 like you have love to say about Pesach Shani, God is showing you there's always more content. But it's dependent upon the will. And so which ones, normally we think of the light as the thing that shines out from the menorah. But the truth is, if you don't do the act of lighting it, that light will never come. And so when you look back at Bahalotcha, the original statement, there's a beautiful statement that all educators, um, it's a classic that gets quoted, but, um, but it's worth just pointing out now is that when the question comes up, why is the word Bahalotcha, when you lift up or you cause to rise up, it's perhaps the best literal translation, you cause to rise up, it's a he feel. Um, these lights, what, what does that mean? So one of the answers Rashi gives is, well, light them until they burn on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and so that's the sort of, that's what we mean when we say we're giving light. It's not enough just to have the will to light the candle. It's not enough to light the candle and light the world. The light you shine needs to be so bright that it causes other people to catch fire. Right. And, and that's and, what you're seeing also in the Pesach Shemi, because the yeah. reality is to this very day, yeah. We're, we're lit by their original will that there must be something more. Mm -hmm. and we're going to see later on in the same Torah portion, Balotcha, that Moses is the kind of candle that lights other people without taking away from his flame. Precisely. Right. He, we're going to see that when it's time to uh, uh, um, incorporate 70 elders and give them some of his prophecy, he doesn't lose any of it but they gain from it. And that's what a great man is. That's what a great man is. Uh, a great man is somebody who, who gives and, and only gets from that giving. By the it's way, it's also uh, an understanding of what they, what greatness is, which is it's, it's not something that, that you have. And I don't, it's something that you've actualized and I have not yet. Right. Very good. Speaking of actualization and great men and women, I want to uh, dedicate the show today to Rabbi Norman Lamb. Yes. Uh, I love a shalom. Dr. Rabbi Norman Lamb, who was the head of Yeshiva University. I had, had many. Yeah, he was lost this week. He, he, he passed away at an old age this week. Uh, his wife uh, also passed away about a month ago from COVID. And yeah. some people are speculating that he too fell to it. Uh, he, he had been uh, under Alzheimer's for some years. But 
I remember him very well, and I had many an occasion to deal with him directly, and I was just a YU pipsqueak, Shiv University pipsqueak, but I had a lot of opportunities to to play he ball with him. He was president. When oh yeah, he was he was he was, he was, he was chancellor of YU, yes. and uh, and I had a chance to cut it up with him a few times, a few times. And here's here's the famous story. Here's how it went. There was a dorm talk, and it was exactly when Lieberman, Joe Lieberman, was running for VP. Who was he uh, running with? I don't even remember. But anyway, he was running. Uh, he was running for vice president of the United States. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, was it okay? Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. No yeah. sure. Anyway, somebody, so he was running. Uh, maybe somebody in the comments section will help us. And in any case, Google. it was it was Lieberman. It was Lieberman. He was running. Uh, Joe Lieberman uh, was right. running for VP, and he was singing his praise at, at this dorm talk in front of like a thousand students. So I raised my hand, and I said, I said, but 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 Rabbi Rabbi Lamb. Uh, aren't we supposed to have, don't we have our own country that we're supposed to have great political leaders of? Like, why would we want great political leadership in America? Oh, uh, Shlomo says Al Gore. He was running with Al Gore. Okay. Thank you. So I said, I said, uh, I said, uh, I said, shouldn't, shouldn't it be, right. He was a Democrat. What are we talking about? He wasn't with McCain. Of course. Not. Right. Uh, right. Uh, he, he, so I said, well, I said, do we really want a great Jewish leader at the head of this country? If we have great Jewish leaders, they should, should be the head of our country, Israel. So he says to me, he goes, this was in front of like a thousand people. So he goes, Yishai. He goes, Yishai. He goes, do you, do you really expect us all to just pack up our bags and go to Israel? I said, I thought that was the plan. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but we were all in good, it was all in you, good you humor. Never changed, have you? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, why is where I cut my teeth originally. But in any case, but you know, I want I want you to know by the way, it was in love. It was totally with love. People were laughing. It wasn't like it wasn't like this, like the way people talk today. It wasn't yeah. like that. It was like yeah. I respect you as a great intellectual, and we're having a, a public discussion about something. Yep. But like I think you're the greatest. You know, I don't agree always with you, but I think you're the greatest. Uh and uh and he passed away this week. So I just want to dedicate uh, the show to him. Um let's go quickly. Uh the trumpets. I wanted to ask you about this. The transition between shofar to trumpet. Uh, this week's Torah portion has a, a commandment to build trumpets, and you use these trumpets when th when the chips are down. Yeah. You gotta call me. And this is my this is my telephone number. It's these right. trumpets. You blow these trumpets, and I shall hear you, and I shall come to you when you need it, right? So I was thinking to myself, like, why why did we move uh, – let me just find it. Why did we move from um, shofar to trumpet? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it says something to me about something moving from animal to metal. Yeah. Um, I think most critically moving from something which is essentially made by God to something which is essentially made by man. Mm-hmm. Meaning, meaning the the shofar, of course, is manufactured. They take it off the animal. You got to drill a hole, etc. And of course, the the shofarot are made by God in the sense that the metal, of course, but but the 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 process of giving them voice is, is very different. And I right. think it's part of the part of the shift, um, which the, the basic shape of a shofar is made by God. Yeah, but this you're thing you're fashioning it. it out of a out of a nodule of of, yeah, of yeah, copper. Yeah. You're modifying, but these are silver in this case. But um, silver, yeah, silver. Um, sorry. But these, I think that um, it's very important in the sense of uh, summoning Am Yisrael together to really cry out to God. That 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 doesn't happen just like this. That there's a there's a process of preparation of, of crafting right the people into a people and the and the tools to give voice to our desires. That can't just be given to us by God. It has to be truly expressive of our own process. So you're saying you're saying that a shofar is a kind of itaruta de la ela. It's a kind of godly awakening. And really, the truth is, is that the shofar blasts heard uh, at Sinai were a godly shofar blast. On the other hand, uh, what about the shofar blast at uh, at Jericho? Um, we'll have to fit that in. You mean, you mean when the walls miraculously fell? Right. That's right. <laughs> I mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say they're specifically indicative. Really, in a partnership, there's always a, a shift of the like, junior to senior, or we say ikar and tafel, which I think is a better way of saying junior and senior, right? The uh, primary and uh, dependent, right? So I think the shofar represents the fact that God is taking the posture of ikar, of the essential, and we are expressing 
right? Whereas I think that the 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 chatzotot, the the trumpets, might represent the the opposite shift, which God says, I, I want you to take the lead on this. Right. I like that very much. I really like that a lot. I'm glad I asked that question. And I just want to say that the show, that the uh, that it's not just for negative stuff. It's also for moving the camps. Right, the katan tuashe need vnasua machanot achonim teimana. Anyway, you have these blows, and they they move the whole camp together. And it says when you have a war in your land, on on the people who 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 fight against you, blow these silver trumpets, and you shall be remembered in front of God, and you shall be saved because of that. And in your happy days, and in your gathering days, and in your new months, and in your certain korbanot. Blow these things. Make make a noise. Make a noise. And I like what you said. A, a, a noise that comes down from down up and not from up down. Okay. So that's another thing. Then we have the very famous. Now, Rabbi Mike, I know you're low on time. So let me let me put it to you this way. Due to the fact that you're low on time, uh, if you have to go, you just say, Isha, I got to go. And then I'll, I'll just continue on the live stream without you. Okay. Okay. It's going to be a, about five, ten minutes. Fine, you got it. Okay, really, don't let me hold you up too much. Um, okay. Got to see the doc. That's right. Okay, only Briut. Uh, we see. have one of the most famous mini. You ever you ever scroll down a website and then in the middle of a website there's like a scroll bar of something that they have, like so right, you're you scrolling. Get caught in it. Right, you get you caught get in it. Scroll in the middle of the scroll. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, so like, that's wait, 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 that, I can't get out. I can't get out. <laughs> right. I can't get out until I get to the bottom of the mini scroll and then it starts right. to scroll again. Okay. That's to me the the mini Torah book that we have here within the uh, uh, our Torah portion. Literally we have what? Scroll. What's that? Literally a mini scroll. Yeah, that's right. A mini scroll. There you go. And that is the famous inverted nuns around two verses, which we say often, which we say three times a week. And the, the, the words are when the Ark of the Covenant would travel, Moshe, Moshe would declare, Kuma Hashem, arise, O God. Your enemies should be eviscerated. Your haters. Eviscerated. <laughs> huh? eviscerated. That's an interesting ev ev Eviscerated because, because, well, because that's what it says about the... Uh, Scattered, I mean. Scattered. But it says also, like the mentor says that, you know, it would it would kill the snakes and flatten the mountains. And, okay. Whoa. All right. You're to each other. Okay. Fine. You're right. I, I guess I got it carried away. That's fine. Means, I, the means, right. means, means, means scattered. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's to scatter something. Right. Um Vayanusu, but they and they will run before you, Misanecha, your haters, which is a very interesting thing. Like God's got haters. Yeah. Oh, God's I mean, got haters. It's like it's like just just a few minutes ago, somebody on 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 the show on a comment wrote something mean, and I like deleted that comment. You know, I'm like, I don't want negative comments on my Facebook page. Yeah. So I'm like, God, why did you yeah, even put a you hater this way? <laughs> why did you, why do you have haters in your world? Yeah. Like why does why did God create a world with hate with his haters? He doesn't even hate the Jews, which is understandable. He hates he, they hate God. It's okay, or certainly at least popular. <laughs> and then the next verse is, however, I'm adding the word however. However, benucho when it rests, when the ark comes to rest, Yomar Moses would say or it was said, Shuva Hashem, like uh, return, um, return or. Or from the word like sit, which is like yeah, actually come to nachat, yeah. like come to rest. Shuva, what's the what's the tuv? Hashem. No, he says he says menachem tergemol lashon margoa, like like yeah, rest. Yeah, I was I was looking at uncles, but yeah, Rashi says right Mirgoa, right? Right. We can't be shuva to show. Okay, right. Like like rest, like like rest, rest. God amongst what's that? Settle like the lashon of Yeshua. Settle. That's right. Menucha when when it was time to settle, he said. Settle God, rest God, Rivavoto Facial amongst the thousands of the people of Israel, the thousands of Israel. Tens of thousands. The tens of thousands. So so the reason I the reason this verse is so is so interesting is because these two verses is because our, our sages tell us that basically this is a mini Torah scroll within the scroll, within this book. And in some way, you could also say there are not five books of Moses, but rather seven. Because this splits up 
this book into three, the one before, the one after, and this one. But in any case, the Musar movement folks say that this scroll means that all of our sojourns are written. All of the sojourns of the Jewish people, all of our individual sojourns are written. They're not written out for us to see, but they're in there. They're hidden in there. Uh, and, or, or another way to say it is that God writes down what we're up to. Um, and, and our stuff is seen. Our journeys are seen. Our tribulations are seen. Listen, that is such an important thing to note. I had a conversation with someone just recently in the context of my counseling. And um, I think that it's important for everyone, and particularly for Am Yisrael to know, but I think every human being should know that that um, you're, you're never alone. What it means to be created in the image of God is that you are always seen, and therefore you're never alone. Now, on one hand, the reason I say it's important for Jews separately is because because God's got some high expectations of Am Yisrael. So, like, just know, like, you ain't fooling. <laughs> you fool all people around you. You ain't fooling God. But on the deeper level, that that sense, like you're saying, that it's written, that it's noted, um, is that one of the greatest pains a person can feel in their life is that of being completely abandoned. Yeah. And we have a society that that thrives on us, not them, you know, pushing people in the margins, etc. And you should just always know that 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 God doesn't do that, right? That that, that you're never alone. So in the book of Ruth, we have this scene where where these three women who have all lost their husbands, right? Uh, Ruth, Naomi, and Orpah—they've all lost their husbands. They have no children. Uh, Naomi has lost children. And, they're, and the Midrash says that they're walking barefoot because they're so poor, destitute, broken. And they've all lost. They were all much more glorious beforehand. They've all lost their stuff. And basically, they're three women losers walking on a dirt road, not here nor there, not in Moab and not in Beit Lechem. They're just three losers. And Rabbi Citron said to me one year, he said, and you see, God is writing every word that they say. Yeah. Every well, that, word that this the, these the Mashiach comes from them, right? And Mashiach comes from it, but like every, but like these these people who are lost, yeah. God is listening to every word and writing down every word, and yeah. so so whatever station we have in life, we should never lose the fact that, as you said, God is with us, God is listening, and that things matter. Things matter even if you're not in the best station in life. So listen, I think I'm on that note. I'm going to hand things back off to you. I appreciate your flexibility. <laughs> Absolutely, Rabbi Mike. Four. Before you go, let me let me bring up let me call up your banner here for a second. Uh, your stuff can be found your your other podcast, which is the Jewish Story, uh, and your other work, which is also in counseling and teaching at the Pardes Institute, can be found at JewishStory.co. Yeah, and thank you so much. Re I'm re we're rebuilding RobMike.com. So we're, we're looking forward to RobMike.com as well. We're looking forward to that. And thank you so much for joining us. And have a Matzliach day and a good Shabbos. Amen. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Oh, Thank I you. didn't get to wish you also a good Zimmer. Good Zimmer. Good a good Zimmer, Zimmer, which is which is what what Jews say when Shavuot comes around, or in Hebrew we say. Good good. Right. That's <laughs> that's in Sukkos. Yeah. That's in that's in Shemini Atzeret. You say a good Chorif, a good Winter, a good Winter. Good winter. Uh, good but winter. now we say a good Zimmer, which means a good summer. I want to wish yeah. you a good and healthy summer. And I know Amen. you're doing a lot of work through Zoom and through other stuff, uh, and I uh, want to wish you a lot of success this uh, this good summer. Hopefully a lot of health Thanks for so your children, for yourself, and Amen. for all of us out there. All right, take all right care, Rabbi Shabbat Mike, Hello. thank you so much for joining us. We're going to say goodbye to him, but you're sticking around with me, and I actually want to take a chance to go through your uh, comments, which have, uh, which have uh, added up here. Says Erica Nordstrom, I wish the leaders of Israel would put their trust in Hashem and not in other countries' opinions or decisions. Okay, so basically the same the same type of feeling, which is like we can, we should, uh, and God has given us so much strength and army and economy. This is the time not to be uh, small about things, but to go large and to have faith. Um, Luis says, treating people as problems is a category led to the final solution. Good point. Uh, let's see. Stephen Brown wants to know what about Har Habayit. Good news, Stephen. Har Habayit is reopened, <coughs> and Jews are going up there and praying. Maybe not praying out loud, but praying strong. My mom was already up there, so uh, so you could see the Jews are back. But, of course, we're not in full sovereignty on the very heart of our heartland, and it's time to go back up. Um, 
Amir, my good friend, says, we delegate the responsibility of our residents at the time we surrendered their future to uh, our own enemies. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Amir, but I think what I understand is if we're going to be responsible for them in our land, we've got to take that responsibility not and not uh, try to pawn it off to create a Palestinian authority to, to deal with them. Uh, Z Corp Alpha says, okay, I got one for you. A Cuban cigar shop was attacked by riot people in Miami. It had nothing to do with the incident. What did he do to deserve this? This was his private business. Nobody, uh, Z Corp, is, uh, is saying in any way that anybody deserves to be looted and certainly not decent and good businesses. Nobody. Um, and I'm, I, I, you know what I mean? It, it's, uh, let, let's, let's be real. Uh, anybody who says to you that, that the frustration therefore equals that people should be, should do criminal acts is, uh, is absurd. Oh, Amir explains, he says, we should never even recognize the PA as administrators of the Arabs. Not all Arabs are with the PA and we uh, never had to empower them. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Deborah says, fascinating discussion, especially about how looking to the approval of a patron U S to declare sovereignty is not good. I agree. Israel is a sovereign nation and should make its own decisions. Very good. Victoria Ann says, very nicely, appreciate your collective insight. Our good friend Yoel Karen calls up the, uh, uh, the beautiful verse about uh, the uh, receiving of the Torah. Vahi kol shofar was the voice of the shofar. Holech v'chazek me'od. Went and was strengthened. Moshe yidaber, Moshe spoke, v'ha Elohim y'anenu b'kol. And God answered him out loud. Okay, and my good sister Racheli, Racheli fleischer Vinick says, uh, beautiful words of Torah. So thank you so much, everybody. Let's let's keep going with a little bit more Torah. I know we've already been uh, an hour through this, but let's do just a little bit more. Uh, what was where was I stop? Where, where did I stop? Oh, we have the issue. Here's our great. You see this book? This is the Rashi elucidated Rashi, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a group of people that had a desire that was wanton. In this case, it seemed on the face of it to be about food, uh, but it wasn't just about food. It was also about other desires. And that's really at the heart of the uh, uh, of this Torah portion's ending, which is the Asaf Suf, the, the folks that gathered amongst the Jews, but maybe were the kind of Klingons, uh, and I don't mean that in a Star Trek term, I mean the folks that came out of Egypt, uh, the, the Klingons who, who were amongst them, they had a they had a deep desire. But the Hasidic masters explain that hitavu ta'ava means they had desire for desire. They were upset that the existence in the desert was one that when you ate the mana, you didn't have to go to the toilet because it was so perfect. And there was just nothing kind of extraneous. They were a little bit like babies uh, within the, their mother's womb. They were being fed everything. And these people were like, wait, but I but I, 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 desire desire. I can understand that personally. I know where that's coming from. Sometimes you just get this desire, like, I want to live. I want to, you know, eat meat. I want to, you know, I, I want to not be limited by, by whatever limitations, religious, moral, and others. And sometimes you're like, what do I need all this? you know, morality, but that's what they're basically saying. They're like, we are, we don't want to be limited by the morality of these systems anymore. We're tired of it. We want to break out and we want to be very, very materialistic. We want to break out of the spiritual kind of uh, world. One aspect of that is good. It's good to want to live. It's good to want to, uh, you know, be part of the world as is. And a certain element of carpe diem is like an element of like succeed today, do great things today, move it ahead today, move the ball ahead. But another side is when you another side of it, which is probably the side of these people, is I don't want God's gifts. I don't want because God's gifts come with God's limitations, and I don't want that. Uh, so, so they and they say, why can't we go back to Egypt and get the stuff that we had chinam, which means free? What did we have for free? Well, they say leeks and melons and and uh, onions and and uh, garlic. But Rashi says, what is it that they had free? They weren't limited to get these blessings through the fulfillment of the commandments. They were getting to them because they were slaves. They were being fed. But they didn't have to 
accede to doing the Torah commandments in order to receive these blessings. And and what 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 uh, what the Torah is telling us is that sometimes you you want to you don't want you 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 want the desires but not the limitations. You, basically, you want anarchy, and that's the kind of people that we're seeing today also amongst the protesters. God says, uh, God says, okay, I will bring you uh, this slav, this quail meat. And that's why we call the show today also um, Cloudy with a Chance of Quail. Uh, and that's because um, this Cloudy with a Chance of Quail means that God said, okay, you want meat? You're going to get so much of this world. It's going to fly in. It's going to Amazon right to your house. And, but you're going to eat it for 30 days until it proverbially comes out of your nose. Like you're going to be so tired. Of, uh, of eating this meat because if you want if you don't trust God for your diet you want the stuff that you want I'll feed it to you to the point that that's what that's the only thing you'll have you'll have it and you'll understand by going to its excess you'll understand what it what it really uh, uh, is what the value of it is which is really emptiness it, it becomes nothing if you don't use it within its proper context uh, Moshe Rabbeinu also gets challenged Moshe Rabbeinu says this is a very important phrase uh, Moshe Rabbeinu kind of loses his confidence in be able, being able to um, control these people. And God says, okay, um, uh, bring 70 elders and they shall um, get some of your prophecy power. You kind of hand it over to them a little bit, but you'll get to retain your power. You won't lose even a bit, but you'll get these 70 people to, to help you. Uh, and two of them say something. What is that something? And our sages tell us what they said is Moshe is going to die and Joshua is going to bring the Jewish people into the land of Israel. So this is the first moment where we hear that there's this kind of rebellion. People are against Moshe. He says, I need more help. And the message is, looks like you're not going to bring in the Jewish people to the land of Israel. There's something here that's like, whoa. Like the minute I ask for help, it's like I can't do it anymore. Uh, you, you, I can't do the full mission. Um, so there's something kind of, kind of painful about that. But Moshe Rabbeinu, in his am amazing heights, uh, when he hears this prophecy, uh, uh, his servant says, uh, how about we arrest them, stop them, throw them out of the camp? And he says, it should only be that all the Jewish people should have this kind of prophecy. May they all be prophets. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm not looking to be the all-out leader. I'm looking to be a um, conduit, a channel of blessing. And if there's other channels, wonderful, because I'm here to be a servant of God. And if the news is that I'm not going in, I can accept that as long as the Jewish people are all on a higher level. That's fine. Um, and then and then finally, there is this moment where, where God says, uh, I'm, I'm going to feed these people this meat that they want. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, um, well, where are you going to, where are you going to get them? We, we, even if you, uh, even if you slaughter all the animals that we have, you're not going to be able to feed all of them. And then God says this very amazing word. He says, Ata <clears throat> now you shall see. Ha, uh, um, no, no, excuse me. I missed the line. Ha, he says, Hashem el Moshe. very important phrase. God says to Moshe, Hayad Hashem Tikzar, will the hand of God be shortened? Ata, now, Tire, you shall see. Hayikrecha Devari Imlo. You shall see if my stuff, my words, come to fruition or if not. Now, for me, this is a very important phrase. Why, why do I have such an interest in this phrase? Because I think that in the early, um, watch, watch me shift topics to something completely different but related. In the early days of Zionism, there were great rabbis, including Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, who did not understand how it could be that the Jewish people would be ingathered into the land of Israel, but still be relevant on the world stage. Because Israel, this area, Palestine, Maghreb, the Levant, it was all uh, considered backwater places. So he said, but we're so important here in Germany. How could it be that if we go down to the Middle East, we'll continue to have our importance, we may lose it. And proverbially, I like to think that God said to Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, shall the hand of God be shortened? Now you shall see how my words come to fruition. And the way that they've come to fruition 
is through is through the ingathering of the exiles, which at the very same moment of the ingathering has also seen the communications revolution and the globalism revolution. The more the Jews, this is the mystery, the more that Jews come to their small place here in the Middle East, the more they're touching the world, maybe more than ever before. So the more we're kind of a small, ingathered people, the more we're touching and effectuating the world, and that's because of this communications revolution. So that's, to me, God saying to Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, shall the hand of God be shortened? No. Believe me, I can, I can get it done. I can bring them in and affect the world at the same time. That, to me, is something amazing. Uh, and very finally, very, very finally here, is the famous story of Miriam, where Miriam uh, speaks mildly, badly about Moses saying, Moshe Rabbeinu saying, hey, weren't we also, aren't we also prophets? Uh, why is he, why, why did he leave his wife? We, we were not commanded to leave our spouses. We were not allowed to, we were not commanded uh, to refrain from marital relations. Uh, what, what's, why is he different? And the answer is that God says in his anger, he says, my servant Moses is different. He's different. I see him face to face. He speaks to me whenever he wants to. He's on a different level. He doesn't see me through messages and and certain moments and dreams and uh, epileptic fits and and kind of like uh, uh, small touches. We're in touch all the time. He's 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 a different kind of receiver than the rest of you. Even though you, Miriam, and you, Aaron, are very high, uh, it's a different it's a different level. And Miriam gets struck with leprosy. She gets struck with a leprosy. Moshe Rabbeinu immediately prays for her. Elna Rafana la Hashem, please heal her. Beautiful, beautiful, poetic words that Moshe Rabbeinu in a moment of crisis comes out. Elna, oh God, please, Rafana, please uh, uh, heal her. Uh, Rafana la, please heal her. That's a, that's a, that's a kind of a, a powerful request. And she uh, gets sent to seven days of uh, uh, of being outside of the camp uh, until she on quarantine until she gets brought back in. So what we see here is a whole Torah portion where uh, people with want and desires want want and desires, uh, and they're angry at Moses. God is angry at them. Uh, we see that we have um, some people. Uh, uh, who 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 are prophesying that Moses is dying, and other in his own family saying something untoward about him. On the one hand, on the other hand, we see the menorah, the leadership of the Maccabees. We see the folks of uh, the Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. We see the folks of the uh, silver trumpets, making the silver trumpets and blowing them, and and calling out to God from 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 our world to His, uh, for Him to come down and and, and save us and and celebrate with us. And so we have a very powerful Torah portion. In the middle of it is this section called Kuma, which is Arise. It's not a coincidence that uh, that the organization that I helped create uh, was called is called Kuma, K U M A H, and uh, we our motto has always been, here it is, building Israel together, building Israel together. Uh, and whenever you go to uh, my websites, if you want to donate and be part of building Israel together. Uh, and keeping on and broadcasting Israel, uh, then you, when you go to yishaifleisher.com forward slash donate, and now we have all kinds of donating options. We're going to add them, but you can use your Venmo and you can use your credit card and you can use your all these different pay options, everything that you that you got, we got uh, to match you. Um, um, our, our motto and our efforts have always been to build Israel together, to build Israel together. I have the great schut also to work for the Jewish community of Hebron, and I would love to see you visiting soon uh, at Marat Machpelah. Those of you who can't fly in, you know, when, when the situation allows itself, would love to see you back. And those who live in Israel, the, the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matrix is open. Reach out to us through hebronfund.org, and we'd love to uh, tour you in the land, um, hopefully in health and in success. Our Torah portion is Baalotcha. I really hope that you guys all have a wonderful Shabbat Shalom Umevorach. Uh, and uh, let me just see if there's any other comments that have come in. Oh, Dan Mastery says, uh, uh, we 
Uh, I am building godly vessels, temples to serve God. You build the neshama to fill the holy vessels. Thank you, Dan. And God bless you. Miss you very much. And Jordan says, what's with the, um, what's with the, fa- what's with her father spitting in her face comment uh, by the Lord? Mm. Yeah, very, Jordan, uh, you're talking, of course, about Miriam at the end uh, when she, when she, uh, when there's a prayer for her to be healed. God says, yes, she, she will be healed, but first she has to be in quarantine because she's outside uh, of the camp. And um, my only thought to you about this particular phrase, which is that it says that God says, and if, if, if a father should spit in a daughter's face, shall she not be embarrassed? My only, my only thinking is about this that I want to add to you, Jordan, is that fathers have a deep connection to daughters. Fathers have a very deep connection to daughters. Uh, and so something happened there with Miriam that she, uh, who, she who saved Moses, somehow uh, angered God with relationship to his servant Moses. And my only thought about this is that, that, that God has a very sensitive place when it comes to Miriam. Uh, and so Miriam, when, when she agitated him, there is this, there's this moment uh, and the great lesson is the lesson of Lashon Hara. We have to try, all of us, to use our mouth and our tongue and our lips better uh, in terms of speaking properly, not speaking negatively about other people, not giving the, uh, the, the prosecuting angel any power uh, by not speaking. When we don't speak the prosecu- pro- negatively about people, the prosecuting angel doesn't, ha- doesn't have that ability either. And somehow uh, um, Miriam reminds us of that. She's done us a great service about about reminding us about how God hates when we speak negatively, especially about the righteous people, especially about the great people. Uh, Okay, folks, thank you so much for being with me. And I want to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Of course, you can email me, yishai at yishaifleischer.com. Love to hear from you. You can write to me in, in Hebrew. You can write to me in Russian, although I don't read Russian so great, but you can write to me in Russian. Uh, and you can write to me actually in anything, because today the internet allows us to be able to, with one click of a button, read any language. So if you want to read, write to me in, in the language of your country, that's not a problem. And I am sending you my blessings from the land of blessings, from Judea, from Zion, from Jerusalem, from, from the forefathers and mothers in Hebron, I'm sending you blessings for peace, for inner peace, for safety, uh, from people who are uh, violent, from a disease that's trying to strike at us, uh, and from Lashon Hara, from thinking bad thoughts about others, including our leaders. Let us try, friends, to bless our leaders. Bless our leaders. Let us try to... Uh, um, to 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 find right now a time of speaking well about other people and about ourselves. And since there's so much out there that's destructive, let's be a counter force to that. Uh, and let's be a force of blessing, a channel of goodness. That's what I've decided about myself. Whenever I think a bad thought, I say, I'm supposed to be a channel of, of good energy, not a channel of bad energy. Uh, we're supposed to be uh, 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 channels of light into this world. So. Jordan says, bless you back, buddy. Bless you, buddy. God bless you, all of you guys. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected. Lots of love from the land of Israel and shalom.